Now, the Three Martini Lunch with Greg Columbus and Jim Garrity. And welcome, everyone, to the Wednesday edition of the Three Martini Lunch, along with Jim Garrity of National Review. I'm Greg Corumbus of Radio America. Good, bad, and crazy martinis for conservatives today. But first, congratulations to you, Jim, and other alums of George Washington University, the Colonials, reaching the championship game of the NIT. And you'll find out Thursday night if you can bring home the hardware. It used to be you could chant, we're number 65, we're number 65. But now with the play-in games, are you down to like 69 now? We're the best of the leftovers. Best of the leftovers, you know. Yeah, Look, you'd, it's good to win something, but yeah, you can't get that excited, of, you know. Still nice to win, though. But uh, on to uh, the good martini. We use a little bit of quotation marks there. But we've all, always been pretty skeptical of, of this topic. And finally, yesterday at the CNN Town Hall, it pretty much exploded and people were finally honest about it. If everyone remembers back to the very first Republican debate in Cleveland in early August of last year, the very first question was, show of hands, is there anyone here who will not promise to support the Republican presidential nominee when that person is named on in this very arena uh, almost a year from now? And Donald Trump was the only one who raised his hand because he said he didn't know who it would be, and he didn't want to necessarily commit. And then he waffled on it. Then, he, of course, he had the meeting with Reince Priebus. He signed the pledge, and everybody seemed to be hunky-dory. Then he kept saying, well, if, as long as I'm treated fairly, I'll, I'll, I'll honor that promise. And finally last night, not only Trump, but Ted Cruz and John Kasich all pretty much saying they have no intention to automatically honor that pledge, depending on who is actually the Republican presidential nominee. So, Jim, it's obviously good to have a unified party. You would like every candidate to support the eventual nominee. But we knew going in that Trump was not necessarily going to honor this pledge. And we knew that most of the rest of the people on that stage were assuming that Trump wouldn't be the nominee. So we've actually gotten more honest in this discussion now. I myself began this contest not trusting Donald Trump as far as I can throw him and not seeing why anyone else would. This always kind of gave off a whiff of a desperate pledge on the part of Reince Priebus and the RNC. Uh, it was insisting that somehow, some way, because you know the, 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 one of the most legendarily dishonest guys in the business world wouldn't break his word as long as he'd signed a pledge. And here he like, and the day of the pledge, they had this giant grand ceremony at Trump Tower, <laughs> and he you know held up his hand and all this. And now he's like, yeah, I don't feel like it. <laughs> you know, it, it says a great deal about Trump. It says a great deal about the naivete of Priebus and the RNC. Uh, I think it's clarifying. And um, look, I would like nothing better than for Cruz to win the nomination, whether it's through getting enough delegates or at the a, after a convention fight, because the deadline to appear on the ballot uh, in a whole bunch of states is getting closer and closer. I believe the first one is uh, May 9th in Texas. So the opportunity for Trump to run third party is going to be different. Now, could he run, you know, write in a write in campaign? Sure. Uh, a heck of a lot tougher than having your name on the ballot. Maybe we were always destined to go down this path, Greg, and I kind of think there's a certain amount of vindication to those of us who really doubted that Donald Trump was ever all that committed to the Republican Party. And the pledge proves that his, his seemingly breezy willingness to break the pledge tells you everything you need to know about him as a presidential candidate. Don't you think it always went both ways, though? The people who didn't raise their hand just assumed that even though most of them were horrified, certainly folks like Jeb Bush and Rand Paul and, and, and others eventually on that stage – with Donald Trump, just assumed he would never be the nominee. So why involve myself in this issue when it's never going to happen? And, and now it's a more likelihood that it will happen. Hugh Hewitt likes to say there are a lot of folks who I think it was, you know, Ted Cruz who said, I'm, I'm a Christian first, an American second, a conservative third, and a Republican fourth. Um, and I think, you know, Hugh Hewitt always said, no, but you hear these disputes. People say, I'm not a Republican Party. The Republican Party is leaving me. I'm a party man and I'm proud of it. There's nothing wrong with being a party man and, a, and, and proud of it. I, I would think that most people who thought of themselves as loyal Republicans didn't envision a scenario in which the party nominated someone who they found so utterly unacceptable. I don't think there's anything wrong with saying, no, you know what? I, my faith in the party is shaken. Um, if the party nominates someone who doesn't represent my values, the deal is off. And frankly, none of us signed the tr not signed the pledge. I, I think if you know if Marco Rubio wants to say, or any of these other guys want to say, look, no, I'm never Trump. Um, there's nothing about these guys. Look, you know, then you can then then rip it up and say, you know what? I, I assume we'd be nominated conservative or somebody who was even nominally conservative. We didn't do that, and so we, I'm not going to vote against my values. 
uh, just because of, of my perception of what the Republican Party used to be. All right, on to the bad martini now. And just as we were recording on Tuesday, we found out that Corey Lewandowski, Trump's campaign manager, had turned himself in as a result of the fact that Jupiter, Florida police had charged him with simple battery. And that's a misdemeanor. And it's all in connection with Lewandowski grabbing Michelle Fields, formerly of Breitbart. She was working for them at the time, uh, following a Trump victory speech slash press conference at Mar-a-Lago. And there was, of course, the big changing story of what happened. First, after it was reported, Corey Lewandowski said that he thought he had grabbed a less friendly reporter. Then he denied that it happened at all, saying uh, that Michelle Fields was delusional. He never touched her, doesn't even know her. Uh, Then the Trump statement came out, of course, saying that uh, never even happened. And Trump himself said that after one of the debates. Well, yesterday, the video came out along with the charges from the Jupiter Department, and it showed that he he did grab her. But uh, Trump standing by Corey Lewandowski and uh, at a press avail with reporters, I believe, on his plane in Wisconsin, Trump had this to say. You take a look at she that and you and then, excuse me? She did get bruises on her. Mouth. I don't know if there were bruises from that. Why? Who said there were bruises from that? How do you know those bruises weren't there before? The, that's what the police. I don't know what the police said. How do you know those bruises weren't there before? I'm not a lawyer, but she said she had a bruise on her arm. I mean, to me, and you know, if you're going to get squeezed, you, wouldn't you think that she would have yelled out a scream or something if she has bruises on her arm? I, she, she, me, take a look at her. Let me ask you before, take a look at her facial expression. Her facial expression doesn't even change. Then he says that Corey was trying to save him, uh, Donald Trump, from Michelle Fields, that she had a pen that the Secret Service thought could have been a little bomb. And since Michelle Fields touched him on the arm, maybe he'll file charges A lot of people absolutely appalled by Trump's reaction to this, including a supporter who almost never uh, criticizes Donald Trump. And that would be Ann Coulter, who is on with another strong Trump supporter, Milo Yiannopoulos uh, of Breitbart. I'm a little testy with 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 our man right now. Are you all? Yeah, Daddy, I think Daddy's I, annoyed you? our candidate You're is mad mental. With Daddy? Do you realize we're, we're, our candidate is mental? <laughs> it's like constantly having to bail out your 16 year old son <laughs> from prison. Jim, there's so many different ways uh, to go with this when Ann Coulter is obviously the more sober one in the conversation. Uh, And, of course, just the way Trump has handled this whole thing, you'd think that after the blowback with the whole the Heidi Cruz stuff, uh, he might slow down a little bit. Nope, just pouring gas on the fire. Greg, can we start with the fact that Milo calls Trump daddy? (laughs) Sure. I'd be like, that's healthy, isn't it? Like, that's perfectly normal, completely, absolutely, totally in line for uh, uh, political journalists to think of a Republican, uh, think of a presidential candidate as their metaphorical father. Um, you know, I mean, Jonah Goldberg goes on a great, like, like one of the great uh, problems of progressives is that they mix up the, the, the role between government and family. The state is not our father. We are not all one family, right? We, we don't literally, we, when we complain about the nanny state, we complain about government treating us like children. And here's the Breitbart crowd calling Trump daddy. Okay, <laughs> let's just file that one away. Um, but then beyond that, like, like, I don't know where to begin. On the Michelle Fields thing, one of the things I, you may, I may be previewing a corner post later today. A lot of people in politics lie. That's pretty obvious, right? But usually when they lie, there's a certain like um, discernible political aim that they're going through. When, when a liberal says, oh, Planned Parenthood is great, it, all, it does very few abortions, and, you know, it's, it's really about referring women for mammograms. It's doing this so that uh, taxpayer funding for, for Planned Parenthood can continue um, and to make people think of Planned Parenthood as warm and fuzzy and not total, to, completely not involved in the business of killing babies. Um, when Trump goes on and says, look, how do I, oh, look, maybe the bruises were there before, you know, ah, oh, you know, he was protecting me. She could have been, dang-. you know, when he says things like this, you know, like, like, oh, look, her facial expression barely changed. We have audio of her talking to the Washington Post reporter about how, you know, oh my God, I was nearly in tears. Do you believe that just happened? Right? Like it's right there. W- Greg, you tell me, where's the political benefit for Trump going all out to defend Corey Lindowski right now? Just to say that he's loyal to his people, I guess. All right. And this will impress the people who already love everything Donald Trump does. But to anybody who's not already on the Trump bandwagon, this makes Trump look like a sociopath who will defend his guy stuff that literally gets them indicted. Right. When Trump says, how do I know what happened? You know, how do you know those bruises weren't there before? Well, the cops and the prosecutor certainly seem to think that Landowski was the guy who caused the bruise on her arm. 
Now we're going to see what happens. We'll see if it goes for a, what a judge or a jury, you know, how this plays out. Maybe they'll settle. Trump says he told the guy to never settle, right? But like, we're, I'm trying to think, what is the political benefit here? All this does is get the little cult of Trump to say, oh, he's super duper terrific. He stands by his guy, his loyalty, right? But he, you know, everybody else is like, wow, this is, a, this is an incredibly dangerous cult of personality that will excuse acts of violence. There is an absolute thuggishness here that is completely uh, in, 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 in the antithesis of American political traditions and thought. This is what we are supposed to – the civilization is supposed to rise above, right? And, and we, you know, Donald Trump and, and his so – I'm glad to see you know, Ann Coulter's finally found something she's not willing to defend him on. Um, that, that basically we've reached a point where like, they're trying to bring us back to this Hobbesian state of nature, right? Corey Lewandowski will be beating people up in Trump administration unless he, you know, <laughs> unless the, uh, unless this charge sticks to him and actually gets a year of jail time. You know, what's kind of baffling was Katrina Pearson that you know, I realize I'm like going a million miles a minute now, Greg, and you know, <laughs> um, we only have like 15 minutes for this podcast and I will do, we will end it. You'll sign off. and I'll just start yelling at the room for like another <laughs> three hours. Um, but Katrina Pearson, the, the, um, the, the political sharp knife uh, over on, on CNN uh, said that if, even if Lindowski is convicted, he will keep working for, uh, for the Trump campaign. I'd be like, convictions for battery do not deter you from working for the Trump campaign. There you go. So here we are, Greg. Yeah, this is you know, on a long list of bad martinis. This, is, this ranks among the worst. Uh, on to the crazy. So if only Ted Cruz could capitalize on the events of the past couple of weeks where – uh, Donald Trump has falsely accused his campaign of sponsoring the ad out in Utah, then of retweeting things about Heidi Cruz, directly tweeting things about spilling the beans on Heidi Cruz. The whole thing about the National Enquirer is uh, kind of sorted in how it was handled. But Ted Cruz is not helping himself a lot because Ted Cruz, and a lot of people have said this, even people who like him certainly, is that his ability to address things in a seemingly genuine way eludes him a lot of the time, and it's not just on one or two issues. Uh, yesterday, he was standing with Carly Fiori, and I believe this was, was in Wisconsin, and a reporter asked the, the question uh, that was could be considered out of line, certainly by some, and certainly was by Cruz and Fiorina, uh, about the, his, the state of his marriage and so forth, and here's how it started. More definitively, this National Enquirer piece, by telling us on the record that you've never been unfaithful to your wife. But look. If I may. Jim. No, I'm sorry. I asked the senator that question. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to comment, okay? Do you have first-hand knowledge of his marriage? I'm going to comment. This is an example of the media playing to Donald Trump's tune. So Carla Fiorina jumps in and goes on for a while about all the things that happened last week from the terrorist attack to Obama in Cuba that should have gotten attention. And instead, the media is chasing Donald Trump's tweets. And by the time it finally got to Cruz, this is how it went. This is a very serious question about your character. Will you Last just, question. If, it, if the answer is yes, I've always been faithful. Can you just say Sir, so, I, I recognize that you love going into the gutter with no. these kind of... Sir, the but National Enquirer is already sir, going into the gutter. Sir, I'm going to answer your question. So stop interrupting me. Stop, 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 stop interrupting Thank you. What is your publication? About? The Daily Mail, the, the world's they, most read English language newspaper my, website. They've chased my. Can we use the last question to talk about my granddaughters? Yes. Look, I'm going to give a very brief brief answer to your question. Which is that the, the National Enquirer story is complete garbage. It is total lies. It was planted by Donald Trump's henchmen. And I don't think the people of Wisconsin or the people of America have any interest in tabloid trash. I'm going to focus on the issues that matter for the American people. So, Jim, I think a lot of us are pretty appalled that this reporter would refuse to let the issue go and just keeps pounding crews with it when there's been absolutely no corroboration of the story since the National Enquirer published it last week. But at the same time, Cruz has this thing of being dodgy in the minds of a lot of people, not just on this issue. There was the issue last night at the town hall where Anderson Cooper talked to him about his policy of a, a greater surveillance presence in predominantly Muslim neighborhoods. And it took three or four prompts to actually get Cruz to talk about it. And he had substantive things to say about it. But he spent the first two or three prompts talking about his criticisms of Obama, which many, of course, are very legitimate. But there are things we've heard before, and we're not a direct answer to the question anyway. Yeah, and I don't know what, how much of this to put on Cruz and how much of this to put on the media environment that has been created by this. People are still talking about, and, and you know, in that last martini, you and I talked about Donald Trump retweets about Heidi Cruz and her appearance, right? And somebody else is going after Heidi Cruz on her, her you know. I hate this campaign cycle, Greg. Yes. This is stupid. 
This is a stupid coverage being done by stupid reporters driven by a stupid candidate with a stupid campaign. I, I realize as I do this, I'm sounding like Newt Gingrich, who, oh, by the way, just suddenly realized that Donald Trump tweets stupid things. <laughs> hey, thanks, Newt. Thanks for, <laughs> thanks for that news flash. I'm, you know, I, I, somebody might say a couple like six days ago, Newt was telling reporters, you know, there's absolutely nothing about Donald Trump that worries me. Do you know how we would describe that, Greg? Frankly, <laughs> fundamentally, profoundly wrong, uh, Mr. Gingrich, to use three of your favorite words. So uh, on the one hand, yeah, those crews' responses to those circumstances are pretty uh, underwhelming. I, in a way, we're doing a bit of a service by saying, oh, by the way, Ted Cruz has policies on counterterrorism. <laughs> in a better news environment, in a better country with a better political debate and discussion, we would be discussing these sorts of things instead of, what do you think of the National Enquirer story? You know. The guy from the Daily Mail, like he asked his question, he, if Fiorina wants to jump in, let Fiorina jump in. It's a free country. She's got every right to, to interject and offer her two cents in that. It's a joint event with Fiorina. He gets really snippy about it, really obnoxious about it. And like, again, is this, I, I, I look at that, I, don't, I feel like we, we've now gone down the rabbit hole. We, we now are at a point where we've decided that, you know, Cruz's response to this National Enquirer story looks to be absolute horse crap. Um, I know Amanda Carpenter. I know one of the other women involved. It's it's total BS. Nobody, you know, there's no way to disprove a negative like this. They're never going to be satisfied. And this, you know, people are having their lives smeared out of sheer political vindictiveness. And I'm just sick of it, Greg. And I want something, you know, like this is this is the crazy martini, but I want to like turn over the glass and smash it and start, you know, stabbing people. Um, <laughs> which is probably not improving the situation. I'm sure the headline out of this will be, you know maniacal National Review editor, you know, declares intention to stab people or something like that. Like, I'm sure Corey Lewandowski is putting me on the enemies list right now. But um, the American people deserve better than this. Um, and, and it's kind of just appalling to see what this, is, what, what this debate has become. Hopefully Cruz can rise above all this. We, we need him to, cry, to rise above all this um, because the remaining options are, are really, really grim. Hey, happy Wednesday, everybody. Real Donald Trump uh, is going to have a new tweet out. Uh, at Jim Garrity, slams Lewandowski, threatens to stab people. Sad. Yeah, sad. Oh, believe me. Actually, you know what? Sad will end up being the word of the year. <laughs> have a great day. We'll talk to you tomorrow. See you tomorrow, Greg. Jim Garrity of National Review. I'm Greg Corumbus of Radio America. Thanks for being with us today. And tune in again on Thursday for the next Three Martini Lunch.